Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing today, sir? I am well. How are you? Absolutely fantastic. This is Ben, right? This is Ben. Ben Kessling, yes. Ben, tell you what, man. I wish this book would have been ready for my father who fought in World War II because this is a conversation starter for those men and women who have served this nation and went silent. And, and my God, you have opened up something here that a lot of people are going to be traveling with. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. How did you get them to share the journey? Because, I mean, so many times, I mean, because I live really close to Fayetteville, and we get we get a lot of men and women in here, as well as from South Carolina and stuff like that. They, they don't want to talk about how great of a job that they're doing. They don't want, and, and I'll even thank them for, for doing what they do for this nation. And they go, it's my job. It's my job. And it's like, it's like, wow, how did you get them to say something? Right. Well, you know, I am a Marine Corps veteran myself. Yes. I'm a Marine Corps infantry, infantry veteran. And I think that having that language and that understanding, and then also I've been writing about the Pentagon and the Department of Veterans Affairs for a decade for the Wall Street Journal as a reporter. So um, I have the language uh, to, to, to speak infantrymen's, the infantryman's patois, as I like to say. Um, and, and I also, uh, I'm also willing to listen, you know, and that's such a big thing is, to say, to open up space for someone, whether they're a veteran or or just a friend, right? To open up space to say, hey, I want to hear your story and I want to understand it and I want to I want to tell it. Uh, and it, when you when you give that space to someone and you say, I'm actually opening up, uh, opening up my ears and my head and my soul to listen to what you have to say, it makes a big difference. And I think that the men from Bravo Company were willing to talk to me in such a frank and honest way because I was willing to listen to them and try to understand uh, understand their voyage through combat and through the return home. I was willing to do that in such a frank and honest way. The name of the book is Bravo Company, an Afghanistan deployment and its aftermath. I'm glad that you're putting this out because this cannot be the forgotten war. It's got to be talked about because a lot of men and women went over there to to base, basically to bring stuff together and, and basic, to heal a nation as well as a world. Yeah. And I mean, every conflict that uh, every conflict that occurs, uh, we, we say the same thing, right? Like, oh, we can't forget about this. Right. And uh, we can't. And but every conflict, uh, that's what happens. Uh, it's sort of the it's sort of human nature. And it's also the the nature of the American, you know, the American psyche in some ways to move on to the next thing. And um, I, I really wanted to set this set this story of one unit's of one unit's experiences and the individual men and the dependents of some, some women, um, their experience with the war in Afghanistan. And I think that by setting down the story of one unit uh, and individuals of that unit, their experience on one deployment and then their experience coming home by looking at that specific, um, the specific individual stories, I hope, that I'm able to allow us to remember the generalities, right? Because by knowing, it's one thing to talk about veterans with a big V on mm -hmm. Veterans Day or whatever, uh, or to talk about the war in Afghanistan or to talk, talk about the army. Well, none of those things have faces. And to make a story stick and something that we remember and we want to engage with, it's got to have a face, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to have the face of a friend, a brother, a sister, uh, a husband, a father, uh, a, a wife, uh, a mother, right? And by doing that, I think that uh, by telling this story of Bravo Company in depth, that we're able to put faces on uh, veterans with yeah. a big V or the war in Afghanistan or an army unit. No, I want to tell what what is behind that? What's behind those labels? And that's what I tried to do with the book. Alex Jiroquai. I mean, here's a man who just wouldn't stop. He kept breaking things, and, and all of a sudden he found peace in raising bees. My God! That, I mean, the, he has put his mind in a place where he can find his peace while still continuing to grow. To grow. So um, Sergeant J, he's known as Sergeant J to the men of Bravo Company. Sergeant J is the, is, the, is the man that I kicked the book off with. I talk about his story because Sergeant J, was a, he, was, he was on the deployment that I talk about in 2009 with Bravo Company. But then he deployed on the next one and stepped on an IED. He lost both of his legs to that IED. And Sergeant J, is, he's an incredible person. He, he, he came to the United States in the mid-80s with his parents from Guadalajara, Mexico as an undocumented immigrant. And when he got here... Immigration policy allowed his family to stay, and over time he realized he wanted to serve his country, and he wanted to become a soldier, so he joined the Army. And through multiple deployments, eventually he left the Army because he lost his legs. And Sergeant Jay, he 
he is has such an amazing approach to his army service. He says, man, it's not, you know, like a man misses his legs, of course, but what he really misses is his army brethren yep. and that experience he had. And he got such a well-balanced approach to it. He says, look, the Taliban, they were better than us on the day that I got blown up. And they did their job better than we did. And I got no beef with them because they were just doing what they were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Of course, he doesn't like the Taliban. He fought them, tried to kill them and whenever he could. But, hey, they did their job. And now that he's out, he realizes he can't dwell on, on, on the Argandab Valley because that's just a part of his life. Because a veteran, a veteran is not someone who, whose life ends the moment that they leave that, they leave that uniform behind, right? They continue on. And Sergeant Jay does an incredible job of saying, hey, my military experience was part of what I did, but it informs me. It informs me as a father and as a husband and as a successful beekeeper in California now. Mm -hmm. And his story is so great. Uh, and I'm glad you picked it out because it's it really gives you the full scope of what it means to go from uh, to go from. Uh, serving to being a veteran and then to learn to live with the good and the bad and just the experience of life that combat brings you. And yeah, Sergeant Jay's story is, is, is really great. See, I I've never seen a book like this. It reminds me so much of Colonel, Colonel Oliver North telling me, he says, you are not a broadcaster until you tell the stories of the men and women. And my God, Ben, this is what you're doing. You, I mean, first Sergeant Donald McAllister. I mean, this is a hard ass guy that stick to the book, stick to the book. But, but you, 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 you paint this picture of how everybody either liked him or they did not like him, but he was still da, 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 making sure that everything was done right. That's right. So uh, Mac, this is a, he was, you know, first started Mac in 2009 and he was a hard dude. He had no time for anybody. Right. And you know, you say some people liked him. Some people didn't. Well, not many people liked him. <laughs> Most people didn't. But they wanted to make sure things were done right. You know, he, he was, uh, he, he was uh, a soldier when the Iraq war kicked off and he got blown up when he was, uh, when he was riding in a Humvee and uh, had some, had some serious injuries, almost lost an eye. And, uh, that moment almost uh, set it set it in his uh, in, a, in deep inside of him that he did not want soldiers under his command to find to find the same uh, pain that he found. So he wanted to train them so that they wouldn't get blown up as he did. So that's the way he set his entire career. But Mac is a really cool story as well because when he gets out, he gets out as a command sergeant major. That's about as you know as high as you can get enlisted wise in the army, and. When he got out and finally let loose of the of of that hard acidness mm -hmm. that he had, and that the um you know always doing everything by the book and being that that perfect picture of a soldier, when he was able to let go of that when he retired, it changed. He changed in a way, and he became somebody who went from being a hard ass that nobody <laughs> nobody wanted to deal with. They'd walk the other way when they saw him because they didn't want to get yelled at to a guy who's become an ally, an advocate, and a friend to a lot of these soldiers because he realized, hey, I can't I can't heal my own experience, my own trauma. I can't come to grips with the things that I've that I've seen and done in combat and seen and done happen to other other soldiers in combat. I can't resolve that if I keep being such a jerk to people and keep sealing people out. So he welcomes people in now to say, look, we're not going to compare our trauma because comparing trauma is a, it, that's it, that doesn't help anybody. That just makes us that just makes us more bitter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to welcome you in and say you're working through your demons, I'm working through mine and the way that we fix we fix ourselves and each other is by listening to each other because we never know the weight that is born in the heart of our fellow human beings. And it's incredible to watch a guy like Max um progress from coming from Ponchatoula, Louisiana, um, you know, barely making it out of high school so he could join the army to be in this incredible enlisted soldier. And now on the other end of it, uh, somebody who can be a friend to, to other soldiers who are far, far lower ranking than him. Um, but now he's a man that can help them uh, help them get over there. Uh, get over their experiences. You opened up my eyes when you brought up the subject in it to win it, because now I, uh, through your book, uh, I've learned that if, if a uh, leader says that it means they don't care for the troops. <laughs> yeah. So you're talking about, um, the captain for this deployment, uh, mm -hmm. the captain at Armstrong, right? He's a West pointer. Um, and you know, when, a, when an officer shows up to a military unit, the first thing that enlisted guys want to do is figure out how to make fun of it to win it. And as you say, in it to win it is, uh, is sort of slang for an officer who all they want to do is get a good fitness report, you know, a good progress report from their boss. 
finish up their time with this unit and move on to the next one, hopefully get a promotion and, uh, and not get yelled at. Right. Yeah. That's what it means in it to win it. Well, the men from Bravo company learned over time. And, you know, it, it took a long time for someone to learn this, that Adam Armstrong, he wasn't in it to win it. He was in it to do the right thing by his men. And he worked his, he worked his, his tail off to do that. And, um, and even now, he is he's moved on past being a company commander he was he was a captain at the time now um adam armstrong is a lieutenant colonel mm. uh and he's in charge of a battalion but he still reaches out and talks to the men from bravo company men who got out of uniform years ago he doesn't you know according to our army handbooks and doctrine he doesn't owe them anything they're not in his unit anymore they're not in his chain of command but adam Adam still reaches out and talks to him because he realizes something that good leaders realize and something that can't be taught at West Point uh, and is really, really can't be taught until you you live it, which is when you assume command, you assume a burden, a burden that is with you um, long after, um, long after you're, you, you've, you've left the unit that you're with. And Adam understands that. And Adam is, um, showed himself to be not, not someone who's in it to win it, but someone who's in it as a, as almost a member of the family um, of of the men of Bravo Company. Even ten years, more than ten years after they deployed together, he's still there for them. So that's an incredible story. Wow, Ben, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. I love your energy. I love your passion. I love your compassion for all men and women. You just got to come back here and keep sharing that story. Hey, I will come back anytime. And you know, the because of the where you're at, there's so many there's so many veterans and people who know veterans. Um, who I hope who are listening to this. I really I hope that Bravo Company, my book, is something that uh, can help can help civilians better yes. understand the experience of the military, but also help men and women who have been in uniform and have been there better understand their own experience and see it in these pages. Even though it's about a one particular army company, it's also about that entire experience of combat. And I, I really I really do think that it can help folks understand understand their own lives. Brilliant man. Will you be brilliant today, okay, sir? I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time.